Tarkabuti's coffin, made from planks of wood, smaller pieces, carefully carved and fitted together with wooden dowels and thongs. The two halves have been exactly shaped to reproduce the form of the human body and to provide a snug fit for the mummy in its wrappings. The lid and case were locked together by eight wooden tenons that fitted into the wall you can see at the the whole surface was coated with white plaster that served as a ground for the painted decoration and inscriptions. Egyptian craftsmen had been producing coffins for years when Kabuti lived. They were made from a variety of materials a stone, laminated textile, and for kings, silver. But the preferred material for most people was wood. The type of wood used to make Tarkabuti's coffin has not been identified, but it's likely to have been one of the main species which grew in Egypt in ancient times, such as sycamore fig, tamarisk, or acacia. Over the centuries, coffins evolved from rectangular chests to anthropoid, that is, shaped like a human body. They were not just containers to protect the core. Egyptian coffins were loaded with symbolic meaning and magical potency, because they played an important part in the process of transmitting a person from an earthly existence to afterlife. The form of the coffin, as well as the images and inscriptions on its surface, were believed to work by magic to ease that hazardous passage. Let's look at Tarkabuti's coffin in this light. The mummy-like shape of the coffin conveys the idea that the person is become divine, thanks to the ritualized processing of the body we call purification. The original model for such an image was the depiction of certain gods, as if wrapped in a shroud, which concealed their limbs except for the head. The god most often represented like this was Osiris, who, according to myth, was resurrected after death and then became the ruler of the kingdom of the dead. All ancient Egyptians hoped to emulate this rebirth and to become a manifestation or follower of Osiris. So the coffin represents them in this form, rather like a statue with a back pillar and a pedestal supporting the feet. The box-shaped pedestal can be clearly seen on Tarkabuti's coffin. And everywhere that her name is written on the coffin, it's preceded by the name Osiris, to emphasise that she has been transformed into an immortal version of herself, like a god. I've just highlighted in red here three examples of the name of Tarkabuti, preceded by the name of Osiris, um, but it's written in many other places on the coffin. The face of the coffin is a generic image produced according to standard models by craft workers who may never have seen the original life. So the mask does not give us any clue to Takabuti's physical appearance, hair colour, or age at death. She's represented in an ideal state of youth and beauty. Her eyes are wide open, showing that she is alive, and she wears the floral colour that also signified renewal of life. And she has an elaborate hairstyle. Over the top of it is a headdress in the form of the wings and legs of a vulture. The vulture itself was a divine being, and this kind of headdress is often depicted as worn by goddesses. On the right there is an image of a goddess wearing a winged head type. So putting this on the coffin of Beauty was another indication of her newly acquired divine status. 
the many inscriptions and small images on the surface are elements of a standardised pattern of decoration. It's seen on many other coffins of the same period. These texts and pictures evoke sacred environment. There's an image of the goddess Nut spreading her wings over the breast. She was both the divine mother and the personification of the heavens, and her image on the coffin has two symbolic levels of meaning. Firstly, that Tarkabuti is imagined as being like a child within Nut's womb, ready for rebirth, and also that she will ascend to the starry sky, the realm of the gods. The coffin paintings also orientate Tarkabuti on an east-west alignment, with an image of the rising sun disk on the top of her head and a painting beneath the feet showing the divine bull Apis carrying the mummy towards the tomb. The tomb would traditionally be located on the west bank of the Nile. So these two images signify east and west, two points in the daily cycle of the sun. And by putting these images on the coffin, Takabuti is symbolically embedded in this eternal cycle of sunrise and sunset, another model for the perpetual renewal of life. Much of the front of the coffin is occupied by figures of deities, with inscriptions which quote their speeches, promoting protection, new life, and eternal sustenance for the dead woman. The speech quote here, that of the god Geb, is typical. Words spoken by Geb, prince of the gods. May he give all offerings, all provisions, all things good and pure, all things good and sweet. Pa, that's the spirit entity of Osiris, the lady of the house. The other deities who are represented here include the sons of Horus, two forms of the jackal headed embalmer god Anubis, the eyes of Horus, and a winged figure of the goddess Isis. This arrangement of guardian deities references the night before the burial, when, according to tradition, the newly mummified corpse was imagined to lie surrounded by divine beings who would keep at bay the forces of Seth. Seth was the god who, according to myth, murdered Osiris. He would try to harm the dead person or prevent them from reaching the afterlife. So this armory of protective images of gods with their words is a way of warding off this evil. Although the mummy would lie on its back, the images on the coffin are orientated vertically. In this way, they would be seen to full effect on the day of burial. When the mummy in its coffin was placed upright at the entrance of the tomb. It's a symbolic resurrection, and at this moment, the last rites, known as the opening of the mouth, were performed to reanimate the dead person. This is an image of that moment in the burial rituals uh, on the Book of the Dead Papyrus of Hunefa, about 1290 BC, so several hundred years before Arkabuti. But we know that these traditions were maintained for many centuries. Something like this may have happened at a burial, with the coffin being held upright, relatives mourning, and priests performing the ritual. Observing the correct ritual at the funeral was important, and this is also reflected in the vertical inscription in the centre of Tarkabuti's coffin lid. It calls on the sun god Re Harakti to provide a good burial in the necropolis in the desert on the west of Thebes for the car, the spirit of the Osiris, the lady of the house, 
Ta Kabuti. Directly above this inscription, there is an image of the dead woman adoring Osiris and Isis. And that's the top. And what's happening here is that she is being presented to the god and his uh, after having passed through the judgment. And the main part of the judgment um, in Egyptian belief was the weighing of the heart in a balance. By this means, the gods assessed a person's life record, judge whether or not it would be granted eternal life. Passing this test was an important stage in the uh, process between burial and ascending to the sky. Spirit. Nearly always referenced as a coffin. In more detailed depictions of the judgment, such as the one from the Book of the Dead of Hunefa, uh, top right here, the different stages in the process are clearly shown. Uh, Hunefa is on the left being guided into the Hall of Judgment by Anubis with the jackal head. Next, we see the balance in which Hunefa's heart symbolically weighed against an image of right or justice. Uh, if the heart balances against that, that means he's lived a good life. If it doesn't balance, he's committed sins during his life. And the punishment is that his heart is then devoured by the balance. He doesn't enter the afterlife. Um, however, in these formal scenes, everything always goes well. So we next see Hunefa on the right being presented to Osiris with his sister Nephis and Nephthys. Next. On some coffins of Tarkabuti's time, a painted band across the breast shows this process with the weighing of the heart um, at the right, it's in the image lower left, uh, and then to the left of the balance scene we see the dead person being guided into the presence of Osiris and Reharachti and other deities who welcome her into paradise. On Tarkabuti's coffin, at the top left, all of this has been abbreviated into the small image just showing the dead woman adoring Osiris and Isis. Her safe passage through judgment is not forbidden, but it is impeded. So the coffin reveals a lot about Tarkabuti's hopes for the afterlife, and it can also tell us something about her position in Egyptian during her lifetime. A painted wooden coffin was an expensive commodity and it would have been available only to a person of some wealth and status. Perhaps only about the top 5% of the population could afford a burial with How elaborate your coffin was would depend on how much you paid. Many have survived from this period there is a great variety. Many coffins were decorated inside as well as outside. Uh, this is an example here. So we see Tarkabuti on the left. The other two images show the coffin of Lady Shepanese, uh, who lived or died at least about the same time as Tarkabuti. And her coffin is painted inside as well as outside. As the daughter of a minor priest, Tarkabuti's place was somewhere in the middle of this elite social group. And this is reflected in the adornment of her coffin. It's decorated only on the outside, and it's a competent piece of work, but would not have been of the most expensive kind. Its images are standardized ones, and the inscriptions are short formulaic phrases drawn from a standard repertoire which would have been within the competence of most scribes. There are no specific spells from the Book of the Dead, which would have required a higher level of scribal expertise, and so would have been more expensive. Texts of that kind are generally associated with the burials of more senior priests and officials and their families. Nevertheless, Tarkabuti was well provided for, the death. Coffins such as hers 
were always used as the inner layer of a set, perhaps two or three coffins nesting one inside the other. So she would have had at least one outer coffin and perhaps two. Um, we don't have those. We don't know where they are. The outer coffins at this time were often much plainer in appearance, as that of Chepanese shows. So here again, we've got Chepanese's inner coffin, left and middle, in, and the right hand image shows her outer coffin. And you can see that the outer coffins were often much plainer in appearance. To a 19th century collector, these outer coffins would have been less appealing. So the rest of Tarkabuti's coffin may have been left behind in Egypt, or perhaps it was acquired by another collector and is still waiting to be identified. There is scope for further work on Tarkabuti's coffin. Careful examination of the construction and the individual details of paintings and inscriptions may help us to trace other coffins workshop and this might enable us to locate Tarkabuti more securely within the society of her time. Each step forward brings new questions and new goals for research. Thank you.